Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it's the truth. We thank you that through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we can know that our sins are forgiven, that we have eternal life, we have a relationship with the living God. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, which assures us of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Pray that you bless the reading and the preaching of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews 11, I'm going to read the first few verses, then first two verses of chapter 12. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise." We waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind their country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And we'll just skip to chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Praise the Lord. God doesn't want us to be discouraged in our souls. He wants us to have faith, to look up, to have hope in Jesus the Messiah. Um, About a week ago, I received an email um, uh, advertising a talk which is said all Christians must listen to because it's a severe warning to Christians. Oh, yeah. And... uh, I looked at the blurb underneath and it said that this man had had some out-of-body experience. He died and gone to heaven, and Jesus has sent him back saying that you've sinned, therefore you can't come into heaven. I thought, hang about. (laughs) I don't think I'll bother to listen to this tape. But clearly, if we are kept out of heaven because we have sinned, then it's going to be a pretty empty place. We're going to be kept by the grace of God, and we're saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. And it set me thinking about what is faith? What is the faith which saves us? And this passage, of course, speaks about the faith, the faith which people had in the days of what we call the Old Testament, and looking unto Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. And faith is what saves us. We're not saved by our good deeds. If actually we had to get to heaven by being 100% righteous, uh, then it'd be empty because nobody is 100% righteous. I think I've been a Christian for about 50 years. I've been to lots of churches. I've met lots of Christians, some very lovely people, some a little bit less lovely, but all of them saved by the grace of God. I've never met one who is totally 100% righteous. Have you? (laughs) 
if not, then, well, how are we going to get to heaven? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're saved by the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God, by faith in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, that Jesus has taken the punishment for our sins. He has borne the wrath of God upon himself. And as we repent and believe the gospel, so we enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We're saved by faith. Then tells us that we should do good works as a result of our faith, because that is pleasing to God not to earn salvation, but as a response to the love of God which God has given to us so that we should show by our lives, by our works, that we are believers in Jesus and we want to do good rather than evil. And we have faith. So what do we have faith in? Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 3. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In other words, there is a gospel, a good news message by which we are saved, and we are told to hold fast to this word which God has preached to us, and if we don't, then we have believed in vain, so one of the signs that you have saving faith is you're going to continue. You're not going to give up when things get a bit difficult. You're going to continue in the faith. And if you should fall into sin, then you repent and get back to God and you carry on. You don't give up. And the characteristic of someone who has saving faith is that they will continue. Jesus said, you should know the truth. The truth shall set you free if you continue in my word. So one of the features of saving faith is it's something which you're going to continue, going to carry on because you have faith in God who's going to give you the ability to keep going. And what you're believing actually is that what Paul says here, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the dead, from the dead on the third day. Uh, very simple, actually. The message of the gospel is not hard to understand. A child can understand it, and the greatest intellectual can also fail to understand it because they get their minds all twisted up with uh, logic and all kinds of things which don't really are not necessary. What we need to have is faith, that when Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day to give eternal life to all those who believe in him. And the Bible tells us also we can be kept by him unto salvation. John chapter 10, verse 7, 27. John 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father is given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So you have the Father's hand around you, you have Jesus' hand around you, and he says that none can snatch you out of my hand. So it's a bit rough. He then says when you get to heaven, you, you can't come in because you've sinned, <laughs> because he's kept you to eternal life. And so we have this promise from God that God's going to keep us to eternal life, and we'll never perish, and no one is able to snatch us out of his hand. That's another feature of saving faith, that you have a relationship with God which can't be broken because he's going to keep you to eternal life. And one more scripture before we get into Hebrews. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul's speaking about what it is to be a Christian, to be a true believer in Jesus. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We made him who knew no sin to be sin, or a sin offering, you could say, for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. You've received a new life through faith in Jesus, the Messiah, and he is the one who has taken the punishment for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. If you're reconciled to God, then you have a relationship with God which nothing can break. Now, I don't need to tell you, we live in days of tremendous doubt. 
And there's a huge attack upon this faith, which comes from outside. Some of it comes from inside what is professing Christianity. We've got humanism, we've got the whole woke ideology and all the LGBT stuff and all the things which are telling you not to believe the word of God. You've got evolution telling you that uh, in the beginning there was nothing and nothing exploded and that's how we came into being. You've got the church in many ways compromising and telling you that all roads lead to God, so it doesn't matter if you're a uh, Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, you're all going to God because you have some uh, benevolent God who accepts you, wh whoever you are, whatever you've done, which is not what the Bible says. And all around us, you've got a tremendous attack on the faith, especially upon young people. And I guess we don't have any particularly young people here, but we have to be aware of the tremendous attack which is taking place upon young people in our society today, through the education system, through the media, through uh, all kinds of dodgy things on the internet and TikTok and all this kind of stuff. It's all attacking faith and causing people to believe in anything but the true faith in Jesus Christ. So we want to proclaim the faith, we have a hard job out there. And yet God does want us to do that. He wants us to hold forth the word of life to people, whether they will hear or not hear. And as we look at this, I was drawn to this passage in Hebrews, which tells us about the heroes of faith. And it defines a little bit about what faith is. And it refers us back to characters in the Old Testament, in the, mainly in the book of Genesis, and elsewhere, who uh, were those who obtained a good testimony, it says in verse 2. And it tells us what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if you've got faith that you're going to have eternal life uh, to be with God forever in heaven, have you actually been to heaven? Do you know that you have evidence that there is a such a place? Have you been there? Do you see it or touch it? The answer is no. We believe by faith what the Bible tells us about it. We have some experiences which tell us that there is a God, that he loves us, and we have some experiences which are perhaps bring us into the heavenly realm at times in our prayers, but also we haven't actually been there. So if we have faith, we're believing something which we've not yet received. And that's what God is commending in those who went before us, that they had faith, but they con continued. And as it read about Abraham, it tells us uh, that he was looking for a country, which he had, he's looking for a city which had foundations, whose builders and maker is God, looking for something which would be permanent and eternal, but he hadn't at this point received it. And that's one of the things which the Bible tells us about faith. We have to look for what God has promised us. And it gives us some examples of faith, of those who had a, a good testimony before the Lord. So let's have a look at these, and we'll have a look at the first ones which you mentioned here. First one about creation. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. Uh, one of the biggest attacks we have on the word of God today is on this subject of creation. Uh, we're going to have a visit, I think, on the first week in April from Answers in Genesis, who have a ministry in backing up the book of Genesis. I believe that the book of Genesis is true, that the true account of how we came to be here is found in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and obviously that's something which we have to take by faith because none of us were there. We haven't seen it happen. And it's something which is under attack today. We're told that by many that in the beginning there was nothing. Nothing then exploded, and out of an explosion of nothing, uh, an ordered universe came into being, including our own planet, which is exactly the right distance from the sun to, perform, to support life, has all the qualities of life, all of them came together just by some accidental purpose, and life came out of non-life, uh, out of bacteria or some kind of chemical being. Uh, now, I'd put it to you that you need a lot of faith to believe that. You need a lot of faith to believe that an explosion can bring order. You need a lot of faith to believe that nothing can explode to start off with. And you need a lot of faith to believe that life can come out of non-life. In fact, scientists have told us that actually only something living can give birth to something which is living. So if something is alive, it has to have something which gave it life in the first place. Now, if God is alive and God's always been there for all eternity, 
then it's logical that God can create life in all its huge complexity. I used to say in the beginning that of Darwinism that uh, complex life forms like humans evolved out of simple cells which gradually became more and more complex. They now know that a simple cell contains about a trillion pieces of information. Uh, so there are no simple tr uh, cells. Everything is highly complex. And when you look at it, you have a choice to make. Either you believe what God says, that he made the heavens and the earth, or you believe what men say, that it came about by this accidental process. I think there's actually no question that the logical thing to believe is that God made the heavens and the earth, that there is a God who's always existed, always will exist. We can't explain how God came into being, how, you know, children ask the question, who made God? Uh, well, I don't have an answer to that because God has always existed. I can't actually conceive how a being can always have existed, but that's what the Bible tells us God is. He is and was and is to come, and he always will be there. And there are certain things we have to take by faith because our minds are limited. We can't understand them all. So we believe what God tells us, and we put it into practice. So if you have that faith, then it's something which is going to give us understanding of the word of God. And he tells us also here that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Uh, technical term here is creation ex nihilo, which means making the world out of nothing. So the creation came about out of nothing existing before that, and God actually speaking the word into existence. So as you read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, uh, read the first few verses of Genesis 1. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the light, darkness light, night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament, the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. And it goes on throughout this passage saying, and God said. In other words, that God created the heavens and the earth out of speaking, out of speaking forth a word. It's interesting that the Hebrew for and God said is vayomer Elohim, vayomer Elohim. And the Hebrew word yomer has the root yimri, and from that root imri you have the verb memra. The verb memra means the word. And rabbis actually have said, from, from trying to understand Genesis, that there was something called the word through which God created the heavens and the earth. Somehow God, who is eternal, managed to contract himself into this word, which he spoke, and then the visible earth came into being which is kind of interesting when you look at John chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. A lot of Greek philosophers say that this is speaking to the Greek word logos, which you get from Plato's philosophy. But actually, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he says that it's more likely that John was thinking of the Hebrew word memory, speaking of the Word through which God created the heavens and the earth, and that Jesus was that Word. And actually, there's a passage in some Jewish writings which equate the word with God. So God spoke the word, God, into being, and through the word, God created the heavens and the earth. Sounds a bit complex, but actually, when you look at the Bible, it's what the Bible says, that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created it through the word, who is Jesus, who became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So Jesus was there in the beginning. And when you understand this, it makes a whole lot of sense of the whole of the Bible, that God created this good earth, this good earth, and he created it out of things, out of, he made what is visible, uh, uh, he made what we can see out of things which were not, so they didn't exist. There's a famous story about the scientist who says to God, uh, well, we can make a man out of the earth, we can do that in a little bit of time, give us time and we'll show you how we can make life out of non-life. And God says, OK, go ahead and do it. And the scientist goes and scoops up a bit of the earth. And God says, wait a minute, make your own dirt. <laughs> In other words, you've got to do the whole job from the beginning. Only God could have created the heavens and the earth as it is today. It's 
amazing that people can actually believe the other because I know we're brainwashed with it through school and through the media and everything. But actually what makes sense is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first thing he's speaking here about faith, and if you have that faith, then that's a good foundation for believing the rest of the Bible. Uh, if you undermine that faith, then actually the rest of the Bible begins to fall apart, because it's not just in Genesis that it speaks about creation. It's all the way through the Bible, through the prophets, through the Psalms, through the New Testament. Even in the book of Revelation, it speaks about God as the creator. So take God out of the crea as creator, and a whole lot of this Bible begins to fall apart. Have God as the creator, it all comes together. Okay, let's move on. The next verse, it says, By faith Abel offered to God more excellent service and sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. So we now have an example of faith, and it refers to the story of Cain and Abel. If you're already familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, one of the sort of basic stories from the Old Testament. Interesting how many stories in the book of Genesis are about strife between brothers. And this is another story of a strife between two brothers. And it gives account of the first act of sin after the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve had sinned and been thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis 4 verse 3 it says, In the process of time came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the, of the fruit firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, so now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you, a fugitive and a vagabond, you should be on the earth. First example of sinful behavior after Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And we see here how sin brings a curse. Uh, see here how Abel, Cain is tempted. He says that... The Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not work, do well, sin is, lies at the door. Its desire is for you. You should rule over it. At that point, Cain hasn't sinned yet. He's being tempted. And God is saying that you've got to overcome this temptation and not fall into this sin which you're going to commit. Cain ignores it and actually kills his brother, at which point he has sinned. And you see from the beginning, then he tells a lie, saying he doesn't know where his brother is. Remembering that Jesus said about Satan that he is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So you see the influence of Satan upon the human race right there at the beginning. And what about Abel? Abel has offered a sacrifice which involved the shedding of blood. Firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering he didn't respect Cain and his offering. Cain had brought the fruit of the ground. And although probably both of them thought they, had, they were doing good by bringing an offering to the Lord, Cain brought an offering which God couldn't accept. Abel brought an offering which God could accept. Abel's offering involved the shedding of blood. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And one of the basic points you have right through the Bible is that in order to cover sin, God requires a sacrifice which involves the shedding of blood. It goes right through from the beginning, right through to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Also, you could say that Cain may have just given the sacrifice with a sort of sense of duty, but without any real heart feeling. It appears that Abel actually offered his sacrifice, genuinely wanting to offer a sacrifice in thanksgiving to God for his mercy. And so at this point, Abel actually becomes like a, a symbol, if you like, of Jesus, uh, kind of type of Christ, that he is offering a sacrifice which is acceptable to the Lord. And <coughs> K 
Cain is jealous of Abel because he's offered a better sacrifice. And so this leads to the death of Abel at the hands of Cain. And in 1 John 3, it says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So there's a principle here of evil against good, against good and evil and the work of evil working against those who serve the Lord. So again, we have something which points to us of faith. And I think it's also speaking about the redemption through the blood of the Messiah. Speaking to Jesus who's going to offer his blood in order to save us from our sins. So let's move on to the next one. We have Enoch. Enoch. By faith, verse 5 in Hebrews, by faith Enoch was taken away because he did not see, so that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him, for before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, who diligently seek him. Uh, before we get into Enoch, let's just look at verse 6. It says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So one of the things you have to have before you have faith is you have to believe that God exists. Uh, and that God exists, and not only does he exist, but he's also a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, there is something which we have to do on our part, which is to seek God. And if we seek God, he's going to notice that we seek him and he's going to reward us. That tells us that God is not just a living God, he's also a God who's involved and concerned about what goes on here on the earth. And he's involved and concerned about you and me, our lives. We matter to him. So if we diligently seek him, he's going to reward us. So he's encouraging us to have faith, but not just have a passive faith, but an active faith, which is going to seek God. Mind that Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and it shall be added unto you. Ask and you shall receive. Uh, so Jesus encourages us also to seek God, to ask him, to receive from him, and to receive from him blessings so that we can serve him. Now we find another few interesting things about this character, Enoch. Enoch was one of the uh, patriarchs who lived before the flood. Uh, one of the descendants of Adam in the, what was become the righteous line of uh, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, through to Noah. Uh, interesting group of characters. You find them in Genesis chapter 5. Now, I have told you this before, but perhaps uh, some of you haven't heard it before, but if you put those names together, Adam, which means man as opposed to not just man as opposed to woman, man as, as a human being, as it were. Adam, man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahalalel means God who is to be praised. Jared means comes down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means weary. Noah means rest. Put those together in a sentence, you have man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but God who is to be praised shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the weary rest. Statement of the gospel in those names from Genesis chapter 5. And Enoch is one of the central characters. He's the only one who actually were told anything about him. Um, his name actually means teacher or teaching. And he gives his son an interesting name. name. It's Met Ushalach, which means literally died and sent. Could mean his death shall bring, or it could mean when he has died it shall be sent. Now if you work out the, the timing in Genesis chapter 5, you'll find that Enoch gave birth to Methuselah, gave him this name, his, when he has died it shall be sent. Methuselah is the oldest man in the Bible. He lived 969 years. In fact, they all lived a long time. Why did they live a longer time? Because before the flood, the conditions on the earth were different and people lived for much longer. Uh, he died after 969 years, and if you work out the dates, the flood came at the time when Methuselah died. So when Methuselah died, it was sent, the flood was sent. So Enoch was actually a prophet giving his son this name, which would lead up to the flood, uh, which would be subject of the next character we're going to look at. Also, you have a reference to Enoch in the New Testament. 
in the book of Jude, chapter 14 to 15, where it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these things, these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints <coughs> to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But that phrase, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, is taken from the book of Enoch. So what's the book of Enoch? It's a book which is written sometime later, which is supported to be a collection of sayings. Uh, some of it's a bit mystical and a bit strange, and it's rather strange that um, Jude refers to it because it's not canonical, it's not part of the uh, inspired scriptures of the Old Testament, but it's a connection of sayings, and probably this saying was recorded that Enoch said this, and it was passed down from generation to generation. The Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. Is the Lord going to come with ten thousands of his saints? It's what it says in Revelation. It's what it says in, uh, in uh, the book of Zechariah as well, that the Lord comes with his saints. Revelation 19 tells us the Lord's going to come on a white horse at Armageddon with ten thousands of his saints. So God is going to come, Jesus is going to come to the earth second time with ten thousands of his saints. So you have two prophecies Enoch makes, one of the coming of the flood, the other of the second coming of Jesus, which means he's a prophet. And he walked with God. Now again, this phrase, he walked with God, what does that imply? In Hebrew, the word walk is halach, and you have the phrase halacha, which means you're walking, uh, which is the phrase which the rabbis use about your condition, how you, how you act, how you behave. So halacha is a phrase which is used for the teaching of the Torah, how you should apply it to your life. So the phrase walking implies not just physical act of walking, but also how you behave, how you conduct yourself in this life. And Enoch is described here as someone who walked with God, so he had a personal relationship with God, and he walked with God. One day he was walking along with God, and he got uh, so intense in his conversation that God just took him up to heaven, and he didn't die. Uh, so it's one of the remarkable stories in the Bible about a man who walked with God and was taken without seeing death. There are actually two characters in the Old Testament who have this experience. One is Enoch, the other is who? Elijah. So Elijah was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind without seeing death. And Enoch becomes a picture, if you like, of the event which is going to take place at some time, maybe not in, in the not too distant future, when God is going to take a whole group of people straight out of this earth to be with himself in the event which we call the rapture of the church. Thessalonians speaks about the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive will be caught up to meet him when he comes in the clouds of heaven. Thus we should always be with the Lord, uh, going to meet the Lord in the air, an event which is going to take place at one of the phases towards the second coming of Jesus. We won't get into the timing of it, but the Bible says it's going to happen. It's going to be a time when God is going to take supernaturally those who believe in him out of this world to be with him in the event which we call the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks about that. Jesus spoke about one should be taken, one should be left in Matthew 24. And it's an event which is going to take place sooner or later on this earth. Jesus also tells us to be ready for that event in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, to be ready to meet with the Lord at any time. Which implies to me that it more likely to be before the tribulation than after it. But I'm not going to get into that subject at this moment, but it's going to happen at some time. So Enoch becomes a type of a person who walks with faith with God, who also prophesies accurately uh, in, first of all, giving his son a name, but also prophesies the second coming of Jesus, and who's taken supernaturally to be with God. So although he only has a few verses in the Bible about him, he's kind of an interesting character. And he's an example of faith which pleases God, and God takes him to be with himself. So we come on to the next one, who by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Okay, so Noah, uh, who is Enoch's, is it his great-grandson, or is yeah, his great-grandson, isn't it? Yeah, great-grandson. Uh, lives many years later, and he's the one who's going to fulfill uh, this word which is given about something being sent 
And what's going to be sent, we read in Genesis, is the flood, which is going to come because of the wickedness of humanity at that time. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And further down in verse 13, it says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. So you come to the story of Noah, and God is looking down on the earth, and he's seeing that humanity has corrupted itself. Uh, By this time, the earth is filled with violence. Every imagination of the heart of man is only evil continually. In other words, not just are they doing things which are bad, they're also thinking things which are bad, and as a result of corrupt and bad influences upon them, they're acting in a violent and a corrupt and a wicked way. Jesus said it's going to be as in the days of Noah, in the days of his second coming. And what we, one of the things we see about this world today is that there are all kinds of wicked and evil influences which are being put upon people uh, in every nation of the earth. Different kinds of wickedness, but you see wickedness wherever you look, whether it's in Western societies, in Russia, in China, in the Muslim Arab world. Everywhere you look, you can see influences which are evil and bad upon people, even in Israel. And you can see all sorts of things being put upon people which are taking them away from God. And God is angry and God is grieved with what's taking place on the face of the earth because of human sin. And God's calling people to repent and to believe the gospel. But he's also giving a warning that there's a day coming when he's going to no longer put up with it, which is what happened in the days of Noah. And God was telling them they're going to send a flood which is going to destroy the present world. And there's only one way you're going to be saved from this destruction which is coming, which is to put yourself into this ark which... God gives Noah the instructions about how to build it. And you read in the rest of the chapter in in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 how God gives Noah the dimensions of the ark, gives him plans about how to build it, and he gives him the instruction to bring the animals into the ark and so to save them from the flood. It's interesting they've worked out the dimensions of the ark. Uh, Would have been a very large building, very large boat, sorry, And if you wanted to build a floating structure which didn't have to get in a fast time from A to B, it just had to float, and it would stay afloat in very turbulent waters, they worked out that he had exactly the right dimensions for such a building, such a boat. So how did Noah work that out? How do you study it? Whatever you need to study this sort of thing, I don't know what you call it. (laughs) No, he hadn't. God had revealed it to him, because God knows everything. And so he created this ark, which was exactly right, covered it with pitch, which would keep it from the water from coming in. And so God prepared an ark for salvation for Noah and his family, for them, for the continuation of the human race. And all of us, wherever we come from, whatever our background, our racial characteristics are, we're all descendant from Noah and his family. And all the animals on the earth today are descended from the animals which went into the ark got different types and different varieties. He didn't have to take every kind of dog. He just had to take two members of the dog kind. He didn't have to take every kind of cat. He just had to take two members of the cat kind. They would then reproduce and create all the different varieties which we have on the earth today. By the way, we do believe in what we call microevolution. In other words, species do change. We don't believe in macroevolution, which is that cats don't turn into dogs, apes don't turn into humans, and so on. But within the species, then there's obviously variety. And they're all descended from Noah and the animals which went into the ark. And so God warned them about a judgment which was coming. And he showed them the way of salvation, a place to go to be saved. And Jesus said, it's going to be as in the days of Noah, so will be the days of the second coming. Can you see there's an exact parallel with that and what's happening today? God's actually giving a warning to the world today. There's a judgment coming upon the world because of the wickedness, because of the violence, because of the corruption, because of the godlessness which is in the world today. There's a day coming when God is going to say, enough, I'm going to bring it to an end. And there's going to be one way that you can be saved from this. That's to go into the ark which I prepared for you through faith in Jesus the Messiah. 
If you're in that ark, you're safe. If you're not, you're under the judgment of God and you're going to face tribulation and ultimately eternal separation from God in hell. And God doesn't want anyone to go there because God wants us all to be saved. So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So Noah is a type of salvation. Also, we see that in the ark, there was one door and one way in. And when the waters came, you can imagine that some people might have wanted to get into the, the ark, but the door was slammed shut and they couldn't get in. So the day coming when the door would be shut and it'd be too late to get saved. So now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to make sure that you are in the ark of salvation and ready to meet with Jesus. Okay, I think uh, I just mentioned Abraham. I'm going to go into Abraham a bit more later on. But Abraham, the next character we find in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, this is verse 1 of Genesis 12, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. Make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 20, 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham, <coughs> Abraham is known as the father of the faithful. Uh, he obeyed God, to God's call to leave his country and go to the promised land. And that was a tremendous act of faith, wasn't it? He hadn't been there, he didn't know what it was like, but God told him to leave that, his country, which he was familiar with, and go to another country, and God would bless him there. Uh, I'll make you a great nation, I'll make your name great. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And God fulfilled that promise. God gave to Abraham a covenant that he gave to him the title deeds of descent of the ownership of the land upon which he was a stranger, give a multitude of descendants, and that through those descendants, and particularly through one particular descendant, all the families of the earth will be blessed through the Messiah. So we have Abraham as a type of the faithful man, faithful man who obeys God, who leaves the country but he's in and goes to the promised land, went out not knowing where he was going, and he received the promise which God gave to him. Genesis 15, where God gives the covenant to Abraham, he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. A phrase which Paul uses in Romans to describe justification by faith. It was saved by faith. Abraham believed what God tells him. And simply, justification by faith is just that. God tells you something. It may be something which, on the face of it, sounds implausible, but God is going to deliver on it because he's God. And in Abraham's case, it did seem implausible that he was an old man uh, and his wife was an old woman who was barren and past the age of childbearing and that out of her was going to come a great multitude and through that multitude of people, through the sons of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel, through the people of Israel, God will bless the nations of the earth. But God's able to do it because he's God and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. It says also that Abraham waited for a city whose foundations, with foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So he was waiting for a city which would have foundations, it would be secure, it would be a place which God had made. And that tells us something also about the nature of faith. Abraham had not yet received this blessing. It was what was promised to him. He was looking for a better country, and it was going to come in God's time. And we too are looking for a better country. We haven't yet received it, but if we have faith, we're going to receive it and go to be with the Lord. Uh, I remember watching a, one of those Hollywood movies about uh, early Christianity. I think it was called The Robe. And it, deals, it ends up with a scene where Nero is sending some Christians to their death. And the Christians are going with sort of peace and love and happiness going to their death, and Nero is saying, they're going to a better country, they're going to a better country, and he's like sort of manic. He realizes they're going to a better country, and he's going to a worse country. And it's just, although it was just a Hollywood movie, it just spoke to me that that is the fact, that if you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to a better country, and that nothing can take that away from you. 
And if you're one of the people who's persecuting the Christians, as Nero was, you're going to go to a worse country. And so you're in a much worse state, even if you're the emperor with all the power and all the money and everything which you may have in this world, it's going to be taken away. And so we have faith. And he goes on to speak about a great cloud of witnesses. And he says in the end of chapter 39, all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us that, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So whatever faith people had in the Old Testament, and it was great faith and they did great things through faith, there was still something which was yet to be added to it which would only come through the coming of the Messiah. Messiah who was of the line of Abraham, David, born as a Jewish man, but also son of God, who would come to redeem us and to bring us eternal life. And then we have, just to close, the wonderful verses from chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race which is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have this great cloud of witnesses. Whether the cloud of witnesses means that there are witnesses looking down on us, I don't think it does actually. It means that there are a great number of people in heaven who are really witnesses to the living God, but they're also bearing witness to the coming of the Messiah. And all those saints of the Old Testament time look forward to the coming of the Messiah and look forward to Jesus coming to redeem them. Perhaps they didn't always understand how he was going to do it, but they knew that there was someone coming who was going to be the Redeemer. Uh, we, unlike them, look back to the Messiah coming. And we have the privilege of being able to be grafted into the kingdom of God, grafted into Israel's olive tree through faith in Israel's Messiah, Jesus, and therefore we should also be those who will bless the people of Abraham, people of Israel, and bless them and give them our blessing through faith in Jesus. But we ourselves are blessed through Jesus, the Messiah, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. He's the one who brought it into being, and he's the one who's going to bring it to the end. He's going to be with us always. He's the one who is and was and is to come. He's always been there. He always will be there, and he's there right now for us today. And so we have a wonderful Savior, Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, how we come to faith is through Jesus, ultimately, and Jesus who went to the cross in order to suffer, to die for us, to take the punishment for the sins of the world, and to take our sins upon himself so that we can be forgiven. And our sins will keep us out of heaven, but if we repent and believe the gospel, then the door is open for us into heaven through faith in Jesus the Messiah. So we look to him and we give thanks to God for what he has done for us. And we should also follow the example of these saints of the Old Testament. Lay aside the weight of sin which ensnares us. Run the race with endurance, even if we face trials and hardship. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the first and last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. And through him we can overcome the enemy, Satan, who tries to trip us up and to destroy our faith. Know that Satan's job is actually to harass Christians and to try and undermine our faith. And we need to resist him and to stand on the word of God, having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the victor. And it says in Hebrews here, he's despising the shame and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went through all the shame and the indignity of the cross, the whipping, the scorning, the abuse, the agony of the physical pain, and the worst of all, having the sin of the world placed upon him so that we could be forgiven for our sins. But he did that because of his love for us, for you and me. And he endured so that we can be saved and he sat down at the right hand of God, the throne of God, where he's now interceding for us. And we can come to Jesus with all our needs, with our troubles. If we lack faith, ask him to give us more faith. If we sinned, ask him to forgive us our sins and ask him to cleanse us through the blood which he shed for us and know that he's given an eternal inheritance to all those who believe in him. 
So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved, have eternal life through faith in him. Amen. Let's just have a word of prayer, then we'll sing our final hymn. Lord, we do thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you endured the cross, that you went to a place of suffering and of shame. You endured the spitting and the scorning of sinful men. And most of all, you endured having the sin of the world placed upon you in order that you might redeem us. We thank you, Lord, that you who knew no sin became sin, the sin offering, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Help us, Lord, to walk in, our, in the truth, to be those who glorify you in our lives. Increase our faith and give us faith to endure and to continue with you whatever we may face in this life. And we pray for the lost world around us. We pray that many people in these last days will look upon you and find salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's sing our final hymn. If anyone would like prayer for any need, be happy to pray with you. And may the Lord bless us and encourage us in our walk with him.